welcome to Steve Allen's Music Room, where the music is the start of something big. Visiting Steve in the Music Room, legendary trumpet master, Dizzy Gillespie, lyricist, author, and music historian, Gene Lees, one of America's most honored composers, Henry Mancini, Henry's daughter, Monica Mancini, the singer's singer, Sarah Vaughan, Terry Gibbs and his all-star orchestra, and of course, Steve Allen. Hi folks, nice to have you with us again. And who, whom, not many comedians would say whom, but I say it with Nobody my mouth. Whom do I spy approaching but the young whippersnapper, our announcer sidekick, Bill Maher. Hi, Bill. How are you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to see you. Nice to be seen. Yeah. <laughs> I've noticed something about you young people today. Yes. <laughs> you tend to wear rather... Uh, Eastern European socialist-looking shirts. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean the colors. There's well, the subdued yellows. You know, and I like I like to wear Italian. They look great. It's hard to get parts. But <laughs> body parts. Yeah, that's, no, it's uh, the hell. You look kind of like a daddy out of that. Well, I, I'm dressed in you know authentic 1942. But but uh, anyway, fashions change. Nice to see you. Nice to be seen. <laughs> Good for Dad. All right. Now we can get down to the music portion of our show, which okay. I think this is what it's about. Um, what can I say? You've had great success writing musical songs, which most of them are. <laughs> I, I, by the way, don't believe that success has anything to do with talent or ability or genius. I really? think it's what time of the day you get your mail. Maybe not. I could be wrong about that. No, you could be right, in which case you'd be in even <laughs> worse <Certainly> trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, wh how do you get the ideas for your songs? To give you a serious answer, which is very difficult for me to do, as you yeah. know, uh, it depends on the song. It's a different story each time. As a matter of fact, uh, since I have my own mic, I'm going to take my little body over there and explain how this particular right. number that we're going to open with came about. I had the pleasure, Bill, of performing uh, several months ago on the uh, Fantasy Island show with Ricardo Montalban, you know, with the nice car and the driveway and the white suit. And uh, Ricardo might seem to be a little... Stuffy, some people have said that, but the, but the point is, he is not. Ricardo is a very swinging guy, beautiful guy, incidentally, fine man, and he has good musical taste, and he and I both love Latin music and we love jazz, so we spend a week together not only acting on the show, but exchanging tapes and cassettes, and he brainwashed me with a lot of marvelous, remember the kind of 1952 Cuban music, you know, like yeah. kind of Pres Prado type stuff, Latin? Anyway, so I wrote something just of that sort because I was in that mental groove. It's called That Night in Havana. And uh, we first would like to introduce you to the melody since it's a brand new song. Guys, jump to, what is it, letter F for the, the brass? Letter G. Letter G. Let her do whatever she wants. All right, fine. <laughs> uh, let's just take the brass section so Go the ahead. folks will know how the tune goes. One, two, three, and... That's how the song goes. Now you have no excuse for not knowing. Some other time I'll actually be on TV and you'll see me go like that. Anyway, that's how the melody goes. Now we add the words and it sounds like this. From the top and one, two, three, four. didn't say a girl, I said a woman. Down in Havana, in the old days, I met a woman. I didn't say a lady, I said a woman. It was a tropical night, she was all dressed in white. And it clung very tight That night in Havana 
I saw her fabulous smile I liked her glamorous style And for an amorous while That night in Havana She spoke a little English I spoke a little Spanish She made me feel he managed That night in Havana I watched her do the rumba And I was in love Just watched her do the rumba And I was in love And the melody wants to end in white and it clung very tight that night in Havana I saw her fabulous smile I liked her glamorous style and for an amorous while that night in Havana she spoke a little English Spoke a little Spanish She made me feel he manish That night in Havana I watched her do the rumba And I was in love Just watched her do the rumba And I was in love Again. That's the way it is. <laughs> anyway, the name Mancini could, I suppose, be used as a synonym for achievement in music. Henry started taking piano lessons when he was just 12 years old. A few years later, he became interested in arranging. Who knows what might have happened if he'd started earlier, because he's won three Oscars, six gold albums, and an unprecedented 20 Grammy Awards. His long association with film producer Blake Edwards which uh, involved the creation of the Pink Panther music, for instance, has recently won him an Academy Award for the film Victor Victoria. And it all began with the song he's going to do right now. It's the theme from the old TV series, Peter Gunn. Welcome, Mr. Henry Mancini. <laughs> Thank you. 
I mentioned uh, Henry. I know you as Hank. <laughs> anyway. Hank? <laughs> yes, Hank. <laughs> How did your collaboration with film producer, director Blake Edwards begin, if there's a story there? Oh, well, this was the first. Uh, no, it wasn't the first. Let me think back here. Mm -hmm. Mind if I lay down on the couch somewhere and talk about right. this? Uh, Blake uh, uh, did a picture called Mr. Corey, for those of you who were. 50s film nuts, especially Universal Pictures. Mm -hmm. He directed and wrote uh, Tony Curtis' picture, and I did some work in that. I'm told that you uh, write on assignment rather than waiting for inspiration. Is that right? Yeah, I saw a book up here you have, Steve. It's Sammy Kahn. Uh -huh. You know Sammy's famous uh, thing is, first comes the call. Said, how how <laughs> the did you get call. into the business? First comes the phone call. Yeah, right. And that's what it is. You know, it starts with a call. I, I never... Uh, you don't just I write? Rarely, no, I rarely yeah. write uh, yeah. anything that I don't have a reason to write. I see. People have different reasons to write, you know. Yeah. Has it ever occurred to you maybe you may be depriving the world of some marvelous music by taking that uh, track? It's worked out very well. Well, what's wrong you. with the stuff I've done already? <laughs> yeah, no, nothing at all. <laughs> no, seriously. They, they made the same argument about Leonardo da Vinci. He was yeah. versatile and he was busy, and he only left us only, you know, seven or eight masterpieces, <clears> five or eight, whatever the number is. But had he, you know, had he, he only painted when somebody asked him to. Had he painted when it rained, we'd have forty-seven masterpieces. Yeah, but what about uh, what about the pieces, uh, the the Mozart things and the Haydn, you know, that wrote for the courts of their time, mm -hmm. and uh, those were uh, well, there's no those were all on assignment. You know, I, they had to have true. two cantatas by Saturday. Yeah, and you you constantly write anyway, so I guess the point is moot. Now then, one of your new assignments is for a picture called Condor Man, a Disney movie. And I thought it would be interesting for the folks watching to uh, hear at least a brief discussion of the technique of writing music. <clears throat> the creative part, uh, you know, comes out of your brain. But you have to be, as you know, a musical tailor when you write for pictures. Yeah. A certain thing must yeah. be exactly 17 seconds, not 16, not 22, whatever, exactly. And then the other thing has to be 42 seconds. If I may, I'd like to show first a clip of the opening uh, credit sequence of this film, Condor Man. Uh, there it is now, and you, as you see, there's no music. And this but is, you know something, what? Steve? There was no music in the picture either. Yeah. Until later. I mean, see, all of that is no music. Oh, of course. When, even when it's on, there's no music. Do you follow me, Steve? No, Hank, I don't. Well, I'll tell you when they're there. Now the music oh, I, oh, you will mean start. the sound effects? That's at this what point. I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, the sound effects. I got you. Anyway, somewhere right about in here, uh, as you'll see later yeah. when we rerun this, the music will start. Yeah. Now, if I may so characterize it, at this point, it's a cute little drawing, and there's nice printing there, but there's nothing that would say, make you say, wow. Now, here's a little funny piece of business. <laughs> a Disney picture is a cute little drawing? Uh, yeah, I make so bold <laughs> as to say that. But it, seriously, when it's a silent movie, there's not all that much excitement. In the old days, yeah. when they only had silent movies, they acknowledged that, and they had people in the pit making live music because yeah. the movie seemed dull without any music. Okay, now look, we'll turn the film off here, and this time we'll go back to the top of it. I guess it'll take him a second or two to rack that up. And now we have... The reason I mentioned that, Steve, sure. was that I didn't want people to look at the thing and say, now here it is with music, and there was no music. I see. I was covering my tracks there. Fair enough. Uh, these are what you call your timing yeah. uh, sheets, right? Yeah, this was uh, after, you know, we go in with the producer and director and look at the movie and decide where it's going to be. And then we have a fellow who is a, called a music editor, a music cutter, mm -hmm. and his job is to write all the stuff that, uh, that the, we do. And this is, this is all of the music When you say all the stuff you sheets. do, you mean he tells you he needs 33 seconds? No, so I tell him where you I tell him. And then he writes it down on the paper. He, he writes what down on the paper? He writes, well, let's say, all right, see, you see what you just saw? How's that? Uh, I can't read backwards. Well, for, at home, all they'll see is a piece of typing. Yeah, but anyway, it says, uh, the cue follows, it's, it's uh, 1M1, it's the first thing we had. Condor Man emblem begins descending from top of screen. See, it says no music. Yeah. And the name Condor, dun, 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 dun. he looks at the large sign, his head turns down. Now we're at 18 seconds and begins pointing repeatedly uh, to himself with his hand, with his thumb gesture. And then we go down at 20 seconds. He has suspenders at full extension. Za, za, za. Start music as he suddenly reacts with some dismay. 
Mm-hmm. It's getting exciting. And for dismay, you give him an augmented quarter. I gave quarter. him a dismaying. Uh, dismayed dismay quarter. Yes. You have this may and that may. <laughs> uh, anyway, well, I think that gives us uh, some idea of the background. Now we'll rerun the film again if we uh, may. <laughs> Everything you want to know about this piece is right here on this screen. Now this time, notice now how much more exciting it is. Seriously. Yeah, it's much more. Exciting. Now watch. First the sound there he goes. Effect. This thing is going to fall down on him. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Suspenders. There you go. Mm -hmm. Another one of your, uh, another one of your classic uh, film themes is, the, of course, that from the Pink Panther. Very distinctive. Now, did you write that for the animation uh, in that case too? No, that came. That was an afterthought, not on my part. If Blake knew anything about it, he didn't tell me until until it was time to do it. But he said we're going to have an animated cartoon, and I said, well, that's nice. You know, animated cartoons are probably some of the most tricky and difficult kinds of music to write because mm. of the timings. Anybody that gets up on Saturday morning knows that there's a lot of music yeah. in those things. So uh, I had this theme that I had written for Niven, David, David Niven. Niven, as uh, he was the, uh, what do you call it, the Phantom. He's mm -hmm. the one that okay. left his glove whenever he took something. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it worked out very well. It, it turned out that I had written it and I didn't yeah. know it, you know. Yeah, and you also probably didn't know it first. You'd written a classic. <laughs> Will you do the uh, Pink Panther theme sure. for us now? Sure. All right. Help yourself. Henry Mancini is conducting his own Pink Panther theme. Henry 
was reminding me before the show that the gentleman who just played that saxophone solo is the one who played it on the original uh, treatment, the original recording, yeah, 19... Mr. Plaz Johnson of our band. Yeah. Plaz Drake. Yeah. I suppose everybody who loves good music knows of the many hits that Henry Mancini has written. You've just heard a couple, and then there was Moon River and... Uh, Days of Wine and Days Rose. of Wine and Roses, and so many other great hits. There's one of your songs, which has always been a favorite of mine. I loved it even before I knew that you had anything to do with it. And it is odd that it did not become just as big as uh, Henry Mancini's other hits. It's not unusual when a pretty song doesn't make it. That happens about every three weeks in all of our experience. But it's on in this case, because this was the love theme from the Glenn Miller picture, which yeah. is a very, mm -hmm. the Glenn Miller story, a very big <laughs> film. So, number one, it's a great song. Number two, it was in an important film, and it still didn't make it. But I someday insist I'm going to make it a hit myself because I love it. <laughs> if I, for Don, those who might not know it, it's called Too Little Time. Want to just quickly yeah. run through one chorus? Don or? Ray uh, wrote the words. Don Ray wrote quite, lo lovely, lovely words lovely. for it, yes. yes. Too little time we have too little time The moments fly when I'm with you No time for us to love and laugh enough Summer, winter, fall and spring the days go past and oh they go so fast why can't they last eternally With you will be too little time for me. Lovely song. Beautiful. Our next. Our next guest, and none of our guests leave, by the way, on this show. We all keep in the conversation. <laughs> our next guest is a legend to uh, lovers of jazz who are just playing good music all over the world. His sound is uh, as unmistakable as the, the shape of his famous horn. Welcome. Who else? The great Dizzy Gillespie.
Mr. Dizzy Gillespie. Yes, sir. Jump in. It's always so exciting. I have a couple of little surprises for you, Diz. Uh, we refer to our re research files from time to time. Hank, have you heard of something called Jacksonville and all that jazz? It's like no. the Monterey Festival yeah. or one of those things. They do it annually now in Jacksonville, Florida. They have a marvelous Florida National Pavilion there as a setting for it, and it's really exciting. You were there this year with Wynton Marsalis and Freddie Hubbard and... John Faddis. John Faddis and just a lot of great players on all the instruments. And we're gonna take a quick look at that so you get an idea of why they called Dizzy Gillespie the king of that festival. You'll see a little of the excitement here. Here it is. How about that? Wasn't that something? <laughs> <laughs> I love you too. I'm deliberately asking uh, to see what will sound like a dumb question, but let's see how it works out. Anyway, the only thing that counts is the answer. Why do you think it is that your kind of music has an audience all over the world? In, in Lithuania, they don't know who I am, but they know who you are. You know? Well, for one thing, uh, fundamentally, um, our music stuck to fundamentals, and that's why it's still here now, because uh, Jazz is not a fad, in other words, like uh, no, punk no, rock or whatever. No, it goes on and on and on yeah, and on. It evolves, but it stays here. It's possible to entertain musically without at the same time making a particularly agreeable noise. Uh, for example, nobody could ever have described Louis Armstrong's voice, for example, as pretty. It had a grating, gravelly, rough, tough sort of sound. Great fun to listen to, nevertheless. At the other extreme, there are certain vocalists and instrumentalists whose basic sound itself falls very pleasantly on the ears. Uh, you and I, Henry, were talking earlier about the late trombone player Murray McEachern, who worked in the, the Glenn yeah. Miller story. No matter what he played, it sounded like honey coming out of a horn. Um, then there was uh, Johnny Hodges, who played uh, alto sax with the old Duke Ellington band. Those ballads, he, by himself, he made them all sound sweet and melodious. And certainly one of the pleasantest uh, noises ever to be made by a human being is that which uh, emanates from the throat of uh, Sarah Vaughan. Now, uh, of course, there's a good deal more to her singing style than a pretty sound, and she'll demonstrate that for us right now. Welcome, wow. Miss Sarah Vaughan. <laughs> Before. To think of what we've been And not to kiss again Seems like pretending It isn't the ending Two friends Drifting apart Two friends But one broken heart We love, we laugh, we cry Suddenly love died The story
to kiss again She's not pretending It isn't the ending Ooh, friends drifting apart Two friends But the one broke apart We loved, we laughed, we cried Suddenly love died the story Exciting. Hey, you guys have worked together uh, before, as you don't have to be told. Uh, were you, what was the situation many years ago when you first worked together? Well, I had just uh, won the Apollo Amateur Hour. Mm -hmm. um, you were a teenager? Ten dollars. Of course I was a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I just really actually went to get the ten dollars, you know. Mm -hmm. But I won the ten dollars in two weeks at the theater. And within two weeks, I was singing with Billy Eckstein's band because he came in to catch the show while yeah. I was at the Apollo. And Dizzy was in the band, Charlie Parker Charlie was in Parker. the band, yeah. Benny Green was in the band, Gene Ammons was in the band, yeah. Shadow Wilson. How fortunate can you be? Uh -huh. Shorty McConnell. Shorty McConnell. Great way to start. Uh, speaking of such things, uh, Bill Maher, what yes, are you up I to here? I have a book here because a good friend of the music room is here today. He's a, a songwriter and a jazz authority and an author of a book called The Modern Rhyming Dictionary, How to Write Lyrics. Mr. Gene Lees. True jazz there. authority, yes, indeed. Well, nice to have you with us. You don't have to be introduced. You know all these people. You've written about them. As a matter of fact, in, in your marvelous monthly uh, jazz letter, you have frequent occasion to mention uh, the good and the bad, and these folks always come under the heading the of, of the good. What do you think of every time you see Sarah Vaughan perform? The first, no, I think, first of all, that I think I should never sing again when I hear her <laughs> sing. I know what you mean. But the thing is that, uh, I don't know whether she remembers this or not, that when I was a young newspaper reporter, the first celebrity I ever interviewed in my life was this lady. Really? And she was very young and very shy, and I was absolutely in awe of her. Uh -huh. She was afraid to answer a question, and I was afraid to ask one. And it was, <laughs> it was deadly silence. Worst interview I ever did. <laughs> now what I think of, I've heard her record a few of my songs, and it's uh, kind yes. of mind-blowing. I should explain that uh, I, I couldn't, uh, I was distracted briefly, Bill, while you were introducing Gene. And I don't know if we made it clear that he's also one of the nation's leading lyricists. You've written, uh, lucky you, I wish I had that chance, you've written words to some of those beautiful melodies that came up from South America, such as? Quiet Nights. Quiet um, Nights. Yesterday I Heard the Rain, which is a Mexican tune. Yeah. Um, there's something I've never told Hank. Do you know the first lyric I ever wrote? was on an airbase in England when I was a young military correspondent for a theme from the Glenn Miller story. It became Too Little Time. It's the first experimental <laughs> lyric I ever wrote. No kidding. <laughs> That's all. Literally. Really? Yeah, it was the first yeah. lyric I ever wrote. I don't know whatever happened to it. Yeah. That one was better, probably. Gene and I have really, time and again, there's only this one more instance, the same taste about songs. And it's interesting. Two young guys melody. picked out this, this great melody. Well, Hank's one of the great melody writers of the 20th century, as far as I'm concerned. It's that Absolutely. wonderful quality. Jobim has it. Michel Legrand has it. Gershwin had it. Kern had it. Yeah you know within about three or four bars that it's his tone. It used to be common in the 30s and 40s. Now it's uh, very rare. all too rare. Uh, you know, a moment ago, speaking of being in awe of people, um, somebody told me that uh, Lou Rawls, who was a guest on one of our recent shows of the Music Room series, was back simply because he had such a good time. He hated to, uh, you know, just think of how much fun it was. And they, they tell me he's in the green room. If you are indeed out there, Lou, why don't you jump in and uh, join us on stage here? Let's give him a hand, see if we can get him out. Mr. Lou Rawls. Wow. Well, that's true. You weren't booked today. You just uh, no. had to come back, right? Yeah, just when you told me the other night who was going to be here, I said, I got to come back for that. <laughs> 
And they said, okay, you come back and we'll get your parking space. <laughs> Good deal. Well, that's, right. that's exactly the, uh, the groove we want to encourage here at hey, the music room. Really come in and hang out, be on camera or not, it doesn't matter. It's just a nice place to be. Hey, well, listen, when you get around all these legends, man, I mean, look at that, man. Yeah. Wow, she's so good, man. Oh. Right. <laughs> and he's so stop that, man. Right. He's. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Sarah Vaughan, would you show us again how good you are? Not that we have to be reminded. What would you like to do for us now? Well, I'd like to do um, Johnny Hodges' uh, Chelsea Bridge. Chelsea Bridge, mm -hmm. one of the old Duke Ellington classics. Okay, help yourself to our orchestra, Boy. Sarah Vaughan, <laughs> Chelsea Bridge. <laughs> Great, Sarah Vaughan. You're just a moment ago 
Henry here at the piano was showing me. What was the range that she was working uh, within? Uh, well, she got down to here. <laughs> down to that low and then C. She went, oh, she went up to. Oh. She Can you get a shot of the keyboard oh. here for one second? Just, to, just when you see the space between those. Would you hit those two notes again? You get that shot? The first note yeah. was C sharp, right? The first one. Well, yeah. I think, yeah. Any it's singers that watching? To that, yeah. Any yeah. singers watching will know how very tough One, that is. Two, three octaves. Well, talking about musical talent now, as we do come to think of it all the way through this series of music room shows, you're, the Mancinis are a real musical family. Your wife Ginny, as you know, is yeah. a longtime fine singer. Your son Chris is a composer performer. I uh, understand you've written a beautiful song called "Sometimes" with uh, one of your daughters, Felice. How did that come about? Well, Felice, uh, who is Monica's sister, mm -hmm. who is sitting right Twin, there. Yes. yes, that's right. And uh, she was at the University of Denver. And she was, uh, for Christmas one time, she just sent us a little card. Mm -hmm. And she wrote this poem. Free, free verse. There are no rhymes in it or anything like ah. that. But it was so nice. And it was short. But then again, it said everything right there. And, uh, Interesting. Please welcome Monica Mancy. <laughs> Sometimes, not often enough, we reflect upon the good things, and those thoughts always center around those we so many years have made me so very happy and I count the times I have forgotten to say thank you and just I love them And I think about those people And while we're, while we're applauding, I understand that uh, the young lady who wrote those lovely words, Felice, is in the audience. Felice, come on up and join us. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are substantially out of time, but let's do this anyway. Uh, Henry Mancini keeps writing on demand. Fortunately, he's constantly being requested to do so, so he doesn't stop. The latest is called Harry's Theme. What's it from? Uh, Paul Newman's picture, which will be out in uh, February, March, around the in there. It's called Harry and Son. This Harry and Son. Yes, and this is the uh, theme. It's called Harry's Theme. All right. <laughs> Thank you. 
just going to have to arrange to have this show lengthened to about four and a half hours each time out. We've got to hear something else from Dizzy Gillespie. Shall we do the uh, definitive, the classic, Night in Tunisia? Who's going to stop us? Dizzy Gillespie, Night in Tunisia.
great. Ordinarily, it's kind of a drag if you have, you know, nine minutes of goodbyes to say and not enough time to say it. But in this case, it's okay because it meant we had that much more great music. Good night to our wonderful guests and to you for being here at the Music Room.